So I think if there's any lesson from my horrible experience, all yeah. the way down to the simplest of things, pay attention to your assets and stay yeah. on top of what you own. Don't just expect to earn the income and, yeah. and not, not be mindful of what's going on. You're listening to Property Investor Tales, stories from the front yard. Here's your host, Tabitha Bright. Hello and welcome to Property Investor Tales, stories from the front yard, where I get to speak to property investors from around Australia about their investing journey. My name's Tabitha Bright and I'm the head of coaching here at Positive Real Estate, where we help people build wealth through property. With over 8,000 clients across Australia and New Zealand, there are some incredible stories to tell, which hopefully make your investing journey that little bit easier and will inspire you along the way. So my guest today is Lila Garney. She's the head of contracts here at Positive Real Estate across Australia and New Zealand. So today we discuss awkward neighbourly relationships and the potential for your property value to be impacted, challenges during the GFC and how she overcame some really tricky situations. And as a developer, because her and her husband develop outside of her role with, uh, with positive real estate, when developing goes wrong and how to bounce back from a seven-year Supreme Court case. So enjoy this conversation on all the advanced nitty gritty with Lila. All righty, uh, welcome to the podcast. So today I have with me the fabulous Lila Ghani. She's actually our head of contracts for Australia and New Zealand, I believe. Uh, and so, you know, she looks after everything legal that is positive real estate, her and her fabulous contracts team. Um, unbeknown to many of you, she also has a background in development and, um, and successfully develops right across Sydney. So Lila, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks so much, Tab. Thanks for having me. Um, pleasure to be here. <laughs> oh, no, I, I always feel like I twist your arm to do these things with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you're, you know, you really are a wealth of knowledge and we'd be lost at positive without you. So um I just wanted to tap in today because I know there's quite a number of clients that like the idea of investing. And so what would your advice be for a rookie developer? Because we were chit-chatting before about how it's possible still to make rookie mistakes, even when you're quite experienced. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. Look, you're not wrong there. Rookie errors can be made by very, very experienced developers. Um, yeah. And we still call them rookie errors. Yeah. Um, I think I've, I've been investing and developing um, resident, mostly residential uh, for at least 20 years now with my husband. So, yeah. you know, in addition to obviously my legal background and he, he had a real estate background. So um, taking it right back, um, my husband obviously worked in real estate and he saw some amazing opportunity there. And then he honed in his skills in real estate and we started our own development company and, and started off doing little subdivisions and so forth and then moved on to apartments blocks um which is you know wow. um yeah pretty much what we did um for quite a period of time but anyone can make a rookie error i mean if you yeah. if you are not familiar with you know things like the zoning requirements of, of certain areas if, if you're just looking at a property and thinking this this is just great for developing um you've made the error already you you need to understand the town planning mechanisms you need to understand zoning you need to uh understand soil conditions um height you know things like height restrictions if, if you're looking at that sort of a thing even something as simple as just a, a two-lot subdivision you know um you know what are the parameters around a two-lot subdivision and there's minimum um, lot sizes, for example. You might think that you can subdivide something into two lots because it looks like you can, but that particular council has limitations in that space. So you really mm. need to do your homework and yep. you need to have your eyes wide open. And I think um, something that is really important and it is a cost, but it's a cost that's um, very well borne. You need to surround yourself some, with some really good consultants. So my husband and I have an amazing team of consultants. We've got like engineers, we've got um, landscape designers, 
Um, we've got uh, consultant town planners that we work with. They're uh, the type of consultants that we've aligned ourselves with so that we don't make mistakes um, um, or we learn from mistakes. And legal yes, and, and so yeah. forth. You need to have a team that are there and available to you because if you don't have them, then it's very hard to get what you want um, at short notice. Sometimes right. if you're buying on speculation, for example, you need yeah. some answers really quickly. And, and we kind of tend to have this group of consultants that we work very closely with. And a bottle of wine at Christmas, like, doesn't go to, but you make sure that you take care of them as well. So that they <laughs> The bag of carrots, as Jason says, the bag yeah. of carrots. Don't, don't forget your hampers at Christmas and, and just that, that thank you um, for uh-huh. being on the side type of a thing. Uh-huh. Um, so that yeah so that if you need anything if you want them to answer the phone they answer it straight away <laughs> <laughs> you have to be number numero uno client that's right number one <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good to know I mean who doesn't like a hamper at Christmas not that I'm uh, hinting at all clients hint hint um <laughs> we all we all appreciate a hamper um and so tell me um your role at Positive Real Estate, how does your development experience and your, obviously your legal background's key to being head of contracts, that goes without saying, but tell me, how does your development stuff, how do you work in with the team? Because you work close at your husband, Sam, I'll just clarify for clients that don't know you. Your husband is Sam, yes. who is separate to Sam Saggers, who is, um, of course, our CEO here. So um, our property guru. So um, we might differentiate that by if you refer to your hubby as your hubby Sam and we'll call <laughs> Sam just Sam. <laughs> so you work very closely with um, Sam Saggers and the acquisitions team when they're out negotiating deals, working with developers. Um, tell me a little bit about your role because I don't want to put words in your mouth as to what you do. Um, okay, so I think I jump into into the process of, um, you know, into my role at a point yeah. where acquisitions have sourced um, some quality stock that they'd love to present to, to our clients. Yeah. And it's at the time when they know that's the stock they want to list. I, I, um, I jump in and I review the actual contract of sale and I I go through that contract of sale with a a fine tooth comb. I look for any adverse conditions in there. I look to see if there are any easements or covenants. I look to see if there is anything that's negative in the actual contract that probably um, hasn't been picked up because you don't necessarily pick up on issues just from looking at the site and working out what what sort of, um, you know, what the development looks like. So the contract yeah. usually is the dictator of what's involved in the process of contract for sale. Um, I work with our recommended solicitors so that we can negotiate some um, extra conditions that are favourable to our clients. So we're very strict at positive real estate and we like to protect our clients in a way that perhaps you wouldn't get the same sort of protections um, if you purchased, you know, like in the retail space or outside of positive real estate. As so, a single person. Yeah, yeah. we make yeah. sure that all of our clients are protected with certain conditions, you know, like uh, finance conditions for existing stock or yeah. extended settlement periods um, for some contracts and so forth. We yeah. negotiate the sunset. Well, we try to negotiate sunset dates. That's, that's one that's very tricky because yeah. it's set by lenders but you know the defects period after you've settled or yeah. you know uh inspection um processes and so forth so we really go into the nitty-gritty and make sure that there's nothing untoward in the contract that the clients are fully protected we do checks on the um the developers checks on who you know you might notice that sometimes the the seller on your contract is not the developer that you know, we're presenting to you. It could be the name of a big conglomerate of developers like ARIA Group or Blue Earth Group, for example, but they're not necessarily named on the contract. And we go through the nuances there of ownership and who owns what and if there are any options and so forth in the contract. So very much the detail. I think it's that fine detail of the contracts that we go through before we even present um, a deal um, to anybody at PRE. Yeah. Yeah. And your job really is to protect the clients. And by protecting the clients, you know, we have happy clients and we protect the business that is positive real estate. Yeah. Coach and and um, mentor clients and in investing. 
Um, because it gets sometimes life happens right and it gets sticky out the other side and um, I know I've had my challenges with um, with property and investing particularly when the GFC hit um, you know that threw a curveball for many of us um, I was a low doc borrower I was living off my investing um, and so when lending changed dramatically, it threw a few curveballs that we had to work through. And, you know, there were a couple of sleepless nights if I understate it dramatically. <laughs> um, and, um, and so our job is to try and make sure that our clients don't go through that, right? And I know you've certainly had your fair share of dust ups, which I think uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're doing more advanced stuff and everything you do is far more advanced than I ever did, but, um, you know, the more advanced you do, the more problems you're creating for yourself to manage and work through. And so you build up a lot of muscle around what's a normal problem, an abnormal problem, what to get worried about. And yeah. sometimes when we're coaching clients, we'll pull yourself in, uh, myself in when it's around trickier stuff because it may not seem that momentous to us having done this other stuff but relative to a client's experience it can be really nerve-wracking um, and so talk me through um, you know we work really hard to make sure that clients don't have a financial um, challenge when life changes for them so examples of that would be people lose their job right before they're due to settle a property and the bank has found out people uh I had one lady who was um the major income earner and she got pregnant and the project was delayed and right when she had the baby they were called for settlement and she wasn't working she didn't get maternity leave she was a contractor so suddenly she couldn't get finance so tell me how do you and the contracts team mitigate that risk for clients yeah, yeah. so obviously life throws curveballs all the time at yeah. everybody I don't think there's anybody that hasn't had some sort of a curveball yeah. thrown at them and you know the contracts process is not linear either so you know mm. we might think it's all exciting when we purchase a property and yeah. it's you know we have an anticipated settlement date and I think I think what you're referring to is mostly in the the, the longer term sort of Usually. Yeah. Off yeah. The plans, yeah. um, where you know everything looks rosy no intention of falling pregnant no intention of COVID hitting and me losing my job and so forth mm. and you've got something that needs to settle in about two years time so so contracts work very, very closely with the developers. Um, you know, the relationships that we build, this, this is something that endures and is ongoing yeah. throughout the entire process. So it's not, not just like when you see a solicitor and you go and transact your conveyance and you sign your contract and you're exchanged and then you hear from your solicitor again when it's time to settle. That is not the way contracts within PRA works we are constantly in communication with the developers we're overseeing the the progress of construction we're overseeing delays in construction yeah. we can see if a, if a project is going to be delayed by two months three six seven months or what so and then we do check-ins with our clients as well at regular yeah. intervals to make sure yeah. they're okay or sometimes it's flagged with us that the client has had a change in circumstances and that's where we jump in and we try and negotiate on behalf of our clients um, to somehow extract them from the contracts. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very thorough process and we work really hard to do that. Obviously, it doesn't work in 100% of cases, but uh, let me just say, and, and tabular test to this, mm -hmm. our, our, um, our strike rate has been amazing and we don't yeah. lose, but we, we actually hang our hat on the fact that, you know, we haven't lost clients' deposits, that we've been very successful in um, extricating clients. Um, obviously, not because they've just changed their mind. Uh, yeah. That doesn't work. You yeah. can't yeah. just change your mind. But <laughs> where there have been real circumstances um, and issues that have, have changed a client's ability yeah settle then we've jumped in and we've been able to successfully negotiate with developers to extricate them and find replacement buyers so yeah it's, it's a really special thing um, about positive real estate I've never seen it anywhere else yeah. um, and it's one of the reasons I love I love um, being here it's, yeah. it's our ability to do that and it's it's reputational it's PRE's reputation in the industry that allows us yeah. to do that 
Yeah, hundred um, percent. Because I mean, buying off the plan can seem scary, right? Um, because you don't know what your circumstances are yeah. going to be. You can't apply for finance in two years' time. So there is a certain, <laughs> if I say it, hanging by the seat of your pants feeling. Um, I mean, the the coach and the property consultant will do all the checks and balances. They qualify, make sure that you know they can't see any headwind. Um, any trade-offs or challenges that you need to be aware of, they'll obviously cross off and um, talk you through. Um, but then we do have this um, additional safety net of the contracts team um, headed up by Lila that have this um, capacity to protect clients in that space, which is awesome. And so for yourself, you've, you've had a couple of dust-ups. I've got a hedge on my mind that we'll talk about in a second. <laughs> And this might seem like a small one, but I just think it's so funny because I had a similar thing happen to me. So, Lila, tell me about the hedge because I love this. Oh, uh, yeah. Look, I've had big <laughs> dust ups and small dust ups. To me, this one, whilst it might sound like a smaller dust up, to me was just quite personal. So, I'd spent 12 years growing a, a late and if anybody knows what late and greens are they're those beautiful green um tree-like hedges that grow like grow forever and you can form a perimeter boundary fence just with those you don't actually need a fence the the greenery forms that perimeter for you and it's so slick and clean and our neighbor our hedge was overhanging their fence and mind you it made their property look amazing because they got the benefit of that perimeter as well Beautiful. but you know Privacy we had some screen. issues we mm-hmm. had some issues with the neighbor and they took it out on our hedge and they just completely um, shaved down the hedge uh, by about 30 to 40 centimetres, which shocked it and then killed it off. And so now I have my boundary completely exposed. I hate my neighbours. Um, it is deemed a boundary fence issue between neighbours. And the only way you can resolve these issues is to try and do it amicably or to try, try and do it through fair trading. But, you know, that doesn't get me anywhere because my hedge is gone and it can't be replaced. Um, so I'm just, I can't believe you reminded me of that. Now I'm upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always have a giggle about it because <laughs> I did a similar thing to my neighbour. <laughs> and I was that neighbour and I'm very I hate ashamed. you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very ashamed. The, the tree didn't die. It just looked a bit odd <laughs> for a bit. It's grown back. But it was just over on, it was ruining my, um, what is it, curb appeal at the front. It had grown right over and was hiding half of the house. And so I just changed <laughs> what was up to my boundary. And then I, in, in my head, it sounded like a really good idea, uh, and then Vin was like, Vin came in and I was in a meeting and he said, the, the landscape is out there. He's, he's about to shave the head. He's, he's asked, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, yeah, just fucking. And I, <laughs> I came out and I, I was actually quite embarrassed. And there was a poor little possum in the middle of the tree <laughs> that had built a little nest to. And he was sitting there and he was like, <laughs> he's lost. <laughs> he's lost half his home. And I was too embarrassed to say anything to Nate, but I was that person. I was, oh. I, was the, I was the bad person. So they probably hate on me. They've been very generous. But the reason I talk about this is it does impact the value of your property. And this is why it's so freaking annoying, right? Because like oh, if you were to get a valuation with the hedge there and without the hedge, how much would it change that valuation by? Oh, look, you know? I- Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly with you. It's an eyesore. For me now, it's absolutely an eyesore. And I don't think it will recover anytime soon. So unless I decide to sit tight and not sell my property, I have to accept that that garden aspect and that whole beautiful greenery, which, you know, is what has increased the value of the property, has now just dropped yeah. considerably yeah. and um you know it's, it's just awful and I think it's a lesson to everyone though to try and form some sort of uh, diplomatic relationship with your neighbors and and actually listen to what they're saying and I think this is this is where we went wrong they were yeah. telling us to trim it back we kept saying we would we would and we just didn't because we loved it so much 
and then they just took it upon themselves to trim it. So, yeah, try and have a bit of an uh, amicable relationship with your neighbours um, at worst, not at best. At best is an awesome relationship. <laughs> at worst, you need to have an amicable relationship with your neighbours and make sure that those <laughs> perimeters which form a part of your home and the value of your home are actually well protected as well, not just the actual structure on the inside of your boundary. That outside of the, the boundary sometimes is what has a lot of value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it is. It's true. And um, any other dust ups you want to share? You've got a wide and varied career I, and I have development. You must have a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, when I first started at PRA, obviously you took me on board with all of my um, quirks and nuances. I was stuck at the time in, in a Supreme Court case that had been dragging on. I think at the time it had been dragging on for about five years and there was two years left of it. Wow. So for seven years, yeah. Seven years um, just off the back of the GFC, my husband and I also had a large amount of low doc loans. Anyone that, you know, can remember the GFC yeah. will remember how easy it was to get loans. I you know, wrote it, it on a bit of paper, didn't you? I was, just remember, I remember literally saying to the broker, what income do I need to declare to service? He said 300K. And I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I expect to make 300k like it was only it wasn't that you'd made it it was just that what you were estimating yeah. your yeah. you would draw it was down. based on the estimation of what you think that you were going to make and, and the, they were the, happy absolutely and the lenders were vying for your business so we fell into that mm. trap, obviously and we were just happy go lucky and we had purchased multiple mm. development sites um, and then the GFC hit and we ended up yep. being extremely, well, not even asset rich because the loan, the loan amounts were higher than the end value of, of what the, the properties were because they hadn't been, the, the development potential hadn't been realised. So you've got to remember with development sites, you have yeah. to realise the development potential or the bank has to be very much confident of the development potential. And then when the yep. GFC hit and units took a hit, um, obviously the development potential wasn't something that they could factor in. And so we were heavily leveraged and we had to get out of that without, you know, obviously we didn't want to go down the bankruptcy path or anything. So we wanted to outsmart the lenders and we, we um, offloaded some of our, our properties to a partner and, um, and, you know, we got rid of the mortgages and so forth. But unfortunately, our partner at the time was very unscrupulous. And because we were so busy concentrating on the lenders and the loans, we weren't concentrating on, on the business partner. And we ended up, um, like I said, seven years of you can never get that back. And you have to be meticulous, absolutely meticulous when it comes to your paperwork. And if you are doing any sorts of deals and so forth outside yeah, of the sure. call a normal yeah. process, you make sure that you're ticking all the boxes, that you're still seeing a solicitor and you're, you know, like, again, I can't stress enough. You have to be meticulous with your paperwork and you have to be, you know, I mean, I'm guilty of it and I more than anyone should not be guilty of it. You know, when you just forget about things and park them and you think they're just sorting themselves out. When we have assets, we need to be paying attention to our assets. What are our assets doing? where are things at at any given oh, time true. pay attention to your assets I say this about strata I say it about Dang. property management and I I just you know I, I will yell it you know from the from the rooftops mm. pay attention to your asset and what's going on with it I think yeah. we all fall into the trap of we get our rents at the end of the month we don't even half the time we don't even look at our rent statements I, I know I don't I just collate them at the end of the financial year when I I'm getting them to Vin. <laughs> yeah, right. And as oh, long as rent, yeah, as long yeah. as the rent's coming in, and every now and then you'll notice that the rent hasn't hit the account. But mm -hmm. am I noticing what's actually being said by the property manager? Am I noticing if I've approved any additional costs that, you know, when you sign up your lease, they're allowed to spend yeah. a certain amount? So please pay attention to your assets. Yeah. Strata is exactly the same. We we forget about those minutes, the general meetings and the AGM. Or we just don't read them. Yep. We don't read them. We don't know what the motions are. And all of a sudden we're hit with a massive levy and we scream that we don't know about it when we really did know about it or ought to have known about it because mm. we weren't paying attention to our asset. So I think if there's any lesson from my horrible experience all yeah. the way down to the simplest of things, pay attention to your assets and stay yeah. on top of what you own. Don't just expect to earn the income and, yeah. and not, not be mindful of what's going on. 
Um, yeah, and and that way, yeah, at all. yeah, it's it's, all it's the the passive. passive that passiveness mm. is not healthy um, yeah. for you to get the best value out of your investments. And so um, just close the loop for me. So what was the outcome? Because I remember you'd just start, you'd started and, I, yeah. and you and I initially didn't have a lot to do each, with each other. I was in the coaching, heavily in the coaching headspace. Yeah. You yeah. were up in Sydney. I was in Melbourne and, and we, we knew of each other. We dealt with each other, but we didn't have the close working relationship we have now. Yeah. And um, and I was aware that you were going to court and that was all stressful for you. But um, so tell me what happened. Did you did you end up getting we, a favorable outcome? Yes, we did. We did. We ended up winning um, the case after seven years. But what we didn't win was the loss of opportunity, obviously. And again, loss of opportunity is a huge thing. So whilst we were able to recoup all of our losses, we weren't able to actually realise the lost opportunity. So you imagine seven years post GFC, post Out GFC the market. in the Sydney market, we were our our funds were all tied up uh, for seven years, and so that opportunity we couldn't even, yeah, you just you couldn't leverage you couldn't against quantify it. You, it. you could not quantify the loss of opportunity. Um, and that would have meant another two or three years in the Supreme Court. And we just said, no, we will, you know, we'll win the case on its merit as it is. And we had to give up our claim for lost opportunity. Um, right. And that was a, a huge lesson for us. And it was a reset and we started again. Um, and it's oh. been awesome, obviously, because we've learned to be more careful and we've learned how to mitigate, mitigate risk um, in a much healthier way. Right. And so how did you mentally, because so much of this stuff, like when I talk to people about their investing success, whether they're beginners or whether they're seasoned investors like yourself, so much of it comes down to mindset and managing managing your own stress. Because what is stressful to one person is, you know, water off a duck's back to another. Um, and it never ceases to amaze me how different we are and how we manage stress. Yeah. So, how do you get through having to reset that? How do you let let the loss go? How do you get back on the horse and not be, you know, and not have some kind of post-traumatic stress with yeah. it? Or do you and you just get on with it and it fades over time? Like, explain Look, I, I, I think it's a work in progress. I don't think yeah. there's just, you know... Um, there's no special source for it. Yeah. I think what really helps is if you started from a certain point, then that's your anchor point. My husband and I started from a lower point in our investment journey. We were, you know, very young when we got together. Tell and, me that story. Uh, so so I've I'd, I'd been cute story. for many, many years. We, we, um, I, I actually ran off with my husband at the age of 18 and I thought I was being super smart, super rebellious. <laughs> um, and I, I pissed my family off in, in the best way I could because, you know, I, I grew up a very cons- in a very conservative traditional family and it was like this is the opposite of who I was. You know, I grew up, I, was, I went to, you know, a little Catholic school with nuns and um, that's pretty much who I was. And then I ran off with my bad boy boyfriend um, when oh. I was 18 and he was 20. <laughs> so when I say that our anchor point, um, that was our baseline. We started with nothing. And it's very, it's not that it's easy, but it's easier to reset and restart when you know that you came from nothing and you actually worked to get to where you were mm. yourself. You know that you can do it again. And, you know, we, and I know this sounds very romanticized and very, probably not even credible, but the truth of it was that we were healthy. We yeah. were still fairly young, you know, at the time we were in, in our 30s. We were still yeah. fairly young. We had awesome family. We had beautiful children. Um, and we had, we had skills. And we knew that we yeah. could utilise our skills. That was something that, you know, we didn't lose. You don't lose that when you lose money. You don't lose nice. your skills and your expertise and your experience. And you can hone in on those skills and the experience and the expertise and just start again. And you start mm-hmm. again in a more mindful manner and a slower manner. So, mm-hmm. you know, yes, we wanted to get to the mountain again, but we were very, very careful how, how quickly we did it the second time round. And mm-hmm. we went, we pulled right back and started doing two lot subdivisions. So we went from unit developments, 
when the proverbial shit hit the fan <laughs> um, to just resetting all the way back. And it was just loop two lot subdivisions. We'd find yeah. corner blocks. Um, you know, yeah. we Sam is very, very experienced at reading um, council plans and what we call LEPs, local environmental sort of um, yeah. plans and, and DCPs and zoning. And he'd spend nights poring over all the different planning and all the different development um, plans and so forth yeah. to find corner blocks that looked like they could be ideal for subdivisions. Um, yeah. and, and that's what we did. We even door knocked on a couple of corner blocks and <laughs> convince people to sell their houses to us um that's awesome did it really really slowly that way yeah so and yes he possible. does it full-time doesn't yes, he he's yes. a full-time full-time developer that is his absolute day job um mm. i'm just his sidekick now <laughs> <laughs> i don't think that's true for a second and i don't think he'd say that i know how much he dotes on you um, Lila and I have a joke about our husband baristas that just make us the best coffee in the world. Lila talked me into a coffee machine purchase and I was very dubious at first, but I am forever grateful. It was one of the best purchases I've ever made. <laughs> and Vin is our, my, my hubby Vin is, um, is our barista and I know Sam is, uh, your hubby Sam does an amazing job with the coffees. <laughs> <laughs> he is absolutely the ultimate barista and anybody if there's anybody in the audience that actually drinks coffee you will know that coffee is very palate specific and if you get that coffee taste right you can't emulate it anywhere else and so Sam has perfected my coffee so that it's perfect for my palate and now I can't drink coffee anywhere else um, and if I go to a cafe, I complain. So I'm forever complaining about coffee unless he makes it for me. <laughs> uh, that's going to be our mission when I see you in Brisbane in a couple of weeks to uh, to find a good coffee place because we're <laughs> both going to be bereft without our hubbies. We are. Uh, um, and so to wrap up, a, <clears throat> if I can ask the classic podcast question, you meet Lila 20 years, you know, young Lila, you see her in the street. What advice would you give young Lila if it was possible to time travel um, about the future, about opportunity, about what Lila, what advice would you give Lila? Oh, you young know, Lila. this is something I have mulled over. In fact, I've even done it now thinking backwards. And I think to myself, I'm, I'm you know, Sam and I are very, my Sam, a very yeah. yin and yang. He's the eternal optimist. He's the glass <laughs> half full. I'm the glass half empty person. And I think that's why we work so well. If I could tell myself anything, it would be just to loosen up a bit and take more risk, I think. Huh. Um, I, I would probably take more risk. I am very measured in my risk taking, I am extremely measured. In fact, mm -hmm. um, I analyze risk well, and it's probably why um, I have the role that I have here at PRE, right? Oh, we, we <laughs> love your risk management. <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm I'm a bit risk averse, and I would love yeah. to be more like my husband. Sometimes I look at him, and I very much admire his ability just to see potential everywhere. Um, and if I could say that to myself, it's just like just open your eyes and see the world differently and look at more potential. Um, yeah, I think that's what it is. Take more risk um, in anything you do, whether it's, you know, the things you'd love to do but not quite do, not just in business but in life itself. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's Dance it. in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have like some puddles, but, um, yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, so. Dancing puddles. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm forever trying to get the team to do dance breaks, but I have very <laughs> few followers in that space. <laughs> uh, we're all so worried about looking like dicks, aren't we? So um, <laughs> uh, anyway, we'll leave it on that note. Don't, don't worry about looking like a dick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Um, thanks, Lila. And um, thanks for sharing your stories. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a measurable value to people to hear everyone's stories. And what I love about your story in particular is um, the tenacity that both you and Sam have. And what you guys may not have picked up from this is, is 
the relationship that has been maintained with you and Sam? Like you guys have been together how many years now? Oh, uh, we've been married 35 years. 35 years. You I know, I know. You. When I say it out loud, it seems so wrong. You know, at one point we thought we should just divorce and start again so that we've got a break and we can say, oh, we've only been married like 10 years or something. Because that just sounds, I think 35 years and I think of old and decrepit, but we have just got another half century to go by the, at the rate we're going. Um, and um, I adore him. I love him more now than I did when I met him. Um, and it's, yeah, we've just been through, we've been through good, bad, Bad, ugly, yep. um, and some awesome times as well. Yeah. Aww. So what I'm hearing is work at it. Yeah. Don't give up. <laughs> you know, I'm tenacious. <laughs> <laughs> well, you took a bit of a risk, a bit of a gamble on yes. eloping with your hubby and didn't that pay off? It did. It did. And there we go. There's the lesson. I have to do more of that unless of being careful. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go run right when I see you in Brisbane. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks again, Lila. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Hey, thanks for listening to Property Investor Tales. Remember to subscribe so you get notified every time a new episode drops. As you can guess, I love hearing people's property investor tales. So if you'd like to share yours, then please get in touch with me via email at propertyinvestortales at positivementor.com.au. We would also love your feedback and I would appreciate a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Remember, you can watch all of these podcasts over on YouTube at Positive Mentor or at positivementor.com.au. Until then, take care, happy investing, and bye for now.